Hi everyone, my name is Adam and welcome to another broadcast by Gender Spectrum. I'm so excited for today's program. I have joining me my co-host, my colleague, Mayor Abrams, and I'm also joined by my special guests, jo Joe Wilson and Dean Hamer, and they're the producers of a short film called A Place in the Middle. Uh, before we begin and before I get into everyone's introductions, I do want to plug in a couple of resources. Um, you can always check out if you're a teen looking for resources, if you're a parent looking for resources, and if you're a provider looking for lesson plans, um, templates for forms, information on trainings, you can always check out our website at www.genderspectrum.org. And we also want to always give a big shout out to Miley Cyrus and the Happy Hippie Foundation. Um, they have been an, a key instrumental partner in creating our online community, The Lounge, and so we want to definitely say thank you to them as well. I also want to share that The Lounge homepage does have a new feature. It's our community events calendar. And so if you're at the homepage and you just go to the bottom, you're looking for um, new events, what's happening in your community, you can always check out our events calendar and also share your own events as well. So I want to turn it over first to Mayor to talk a little bit about today's project. Um, and then we'll go into a little of introductions. And then we're definitely going to jump into some conversations with Joe and, uh, Joe and Dean in just a few moments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam, for what a great introduction. So today's discussion kicks off one of our newest groups on the lounge called Reframing Gender Through Film. And this lounge group was created as a result of a partnership between Gender Spectrum and an awesome organization called Frameline. Frameline mission is to change the world through the power of queer cinema. And one of their programs is called Youth in Motion. Youth in Motion provides free LGBTQ films and curriculum to gay straight alliances and educators in schools nationwide. Youth in Motion's 2016 release, Expanding Gender, Youth Out Front, explores the varied identities of trans and gender expansive youth and young adults through four documentaries that allow these brave individuals to share their own stories. The 40-page curriculum and action guide delves further into the films and provides students, educators, and parents the tools they need to talk about gender identity. If you're interested in learning more or getting a free copy for your school or GSA, check out the links in our showcase. Over the course of the next four to five months, Gender Spectrum will be hosting three more live broadcasts that feature discussions related to each of the films featured in the, in the Frameline Youth in Motion collection. For updates about upcoming viewing links, discussions, and online programs, join us in the Reframing Gender Through Film Lounge Group and the Gender Spectrum Lounge. Awesome, Mayor. Awesome, um, Mayor. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the little new content as well? Sure. So today we'll be taking questions near the end of the program. And if you'd like to ask questions, we will to click on the cluster of squares on the top right part of your screen. When you click on that, you'll be able to move back and forth between the Q&A function and the, cho and the showcase, which includes a link to the film. If you're already viewing our showcase, we have links for the Gender Spectrum Lounge, the Reframing Gender Through Film group, a placeinthemiddle.org, which is our topic for the day, and the Youth in Motion 2016 release, Expanding Gender Youth Out Front Curriculum and Guide. Awesome. And awesome. so in the show, so we do have a few links a few up and available. available. Um, there's a link to, there's a link to our, our new reframing, new group, reframing group, 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 gender through film group, group on the lounge. On the lounge. And then we also and have a link to a placeinthemiddle.org, which does the film. film. And then we also have a link to have a link. In case there's an echo in the house, and go and use your side of the microphone, he said, move it. So I do want to give a few synopsis of the film, the place in the middle of the story of a 10-year-old girl who becomes the leader of a group of older boys in Hawaiian dance, uh, traditionally led and done by men. While born female, Ho'onani has long known that she is in the middle, that is, between male and female. 
She is fortunate to have the support of a teacher who herself is Mahu, an individual in Hawaiian culture who represents a third gender identity. As with many cultures in Hawaii, gender is seen as a more nuanced aspect of a person's identity rather than simply someone's sex assigned at birth. Now this film is an example of how binary understandings about gender are far from fixed or universal, or universal and shows how easily a young person's peers can recognize and appreciate someone who is living as their authentic self. So I have this honor of introducing um, colleagues, but dear, dear friends, um, that's both Dean Hamer and Joe Wilson. Dean Hamer is an educator, a scientist emeritus at the National Institutes of Health, uh, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker and New York Times Book of the Year author with a long history in communicating complex and controversial issues to diverse groups and publics. He formed Q Waves, uh, a media company, if you will, with his partner Joe Wilson to produce insightful and provocative documentaries about often overlooked social issues. Joe Wilson got involved in documentary filmmaking through his social activism and longtime work as a foundation program officer for human rights. He produced and directed um, with Dean, Out in the Silence, an Emmy Award win winning film for PBS that launched a powerful grassroots campaign for fairness and equality for LGBT people in rural and small town America. And then most recently, Kumuthina, another PBS film that brings a powerful perspective of Pacific Island culture and values to shed light on the issues of dignity and respect for transgender and gender non-conforming people around the world. Um, Joe graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali, Africa, and spent 20 years in D Washington, D.C. And Dean and Joe now live on the North Shore of Oahu in Hawaii, uh, where they are working on a series of films, um, Pacific Islander voices and culture so, Joe, Dean, it really, really is a pleasure to have you both with us today. Is there anything you want to say before we kind of jump into our rounds of first questions and all that good stuff? Just to say aloha, which can mean <laughs> hello. Uh, we'll also say at the end it means goodbye. And it also means love and honor and respect for everybody. So uh, that's a big part of our message today. So aloha. And it's a huge honor just to be included in your work, Adam and Mayor, and you know the groundbreaking things that Gender Spectrum is doing, and to be here with your audience today. So thanks. Well, thank you so much, Joe and Dean. We really appreciate you being here and being a part of this conversation. So I really wanted to start off with just asking why you wanted to make this film. Um, what about Honami's story initially sparked your interest? You know, this really started out as a project to make a film about Ho'onani's teacher, Kumu Hina, who is a very well-known figure in Hawaii. She's a big cultural leader. She's well-known for her community work. And she just happens to be mahu, which we would call transgender, but in Hawaii means somebody who really has the strength and the power of both male and female, um, something that, that Hawaiians have, have recognized and honored for a long time. So we were filming um, Tina. We were interested in her relationship to this young man, but also in her work as a teacher at a school. And I'd like to say that we planned the story, but really we didn't. We were just filming in the school. And Tina was teaching a male hula, a very masculine, manly type of hula to some young boys. And the boys weren't really getting it. And Tina started using her male side, using her deep voice like that, to get them to learn the hula, and they still weren't getting it. And then this little girl walked in, uh, 11 years old, a sixth grader, younger than the boys, and she said, I'd like to try that. And of course everyone said, no, no, it's only for boys, it's only for older. And she said, just, just let me try. And Hina, understanding how Hawaiian culture respects people who are based on what's inside rather than what's on outside, said, yeah, you can try, but if you're going to do it, you got to be really good at it. And that's how the story developed. It just unfolded in front of our eyes, and, and we just wanted, we found it so fascinating that we wanted to make a film. So I know that the film has been screened, um, well, Kumuhina, the larger documentary film, and then to some extent, A Place in the Middle, the shorter um, kind of classroom version of the film, if you will, um, all over Polynesia, 
all over continental U.S., um, other parts of the world. I'm wondering if you could share just a, a couple of highlights or a couple of unique places where you thought, like, the message that this film is bringing really sparked some sort of movement or discussion in that local community, town, or place, wherever it might be. And maybe also share a couple of highlights from those experiences. Oh, yeah, there's a, that's a long and complicated question and really interesting because, like well on the surface, we're presenting this as a, a look at a Hawaiian perspective on gender diversity and inclusion. When we screen it in different places, um, there's lots of different ways that uh, people can enter the conversation. So we had the great privilege of traveling to China with Hina. And Hina is Hawaiian, but she's also of Chinese heritage. So there was some really amazing and interesting uh, conversations that came up when we showed it to Chinese audiences because they were looking at it not just through the gender lens, but also through the cultural lens. And they related very much to the Hawaiian experience of having, in certain parts of China, your culture suppressed by a dominant culture, and then all that comes with that, like what you lose, you lose your language, you lose like your right to know yourself and who you are and where you come from, and therefore like what some of your own strengths might be. Um, so that was one example for me, I think, of how this story relates to a lot of those aspects of our identity or identities, and how it's important for us to be able to know what those are and tap into them because they're a part of what makes us, you know, who we are, and therefore we should be able to let those aspects of our personalities shine. I think... Um on the other side, um, some of the best screenings have been right here at home in Hawaii. Uh, we took the film around to, I think, libraries, public libraries and schools on every island and um, did screenings that were open to the public. It was a way of introducing families and communities to the film, which is now also available in every school in Hawaii. And what was great about that is that even though Hawaii is quite open about gender and has this tradition, there's also a feeling that we don't really need to talk about this because we're accepting already. And people will often say, well, every family has a mafu in it, so we just don't need to, to talk about it because it's already accepted. Or teachers will say, well, it's not something I would want to bring up in class because it might make people uncomfortable, really meaning the parents uncomfortable even when the students... Um, so what was great about those screenings is it was an opportunity to open up a conversation that people don't actually often have because they think they don't need to. And to point out that kids are very sensitive, and if kids know that you're not talking about them, then there's something wrong with them. And that if you don't talk about Mahu, or you don't talk about being in the middle, or you don't talk about being... Well, what Westerners might call non-gender binary, that that's sending a signal very much by itself and that it is something good to talk about. Um, I think what we heard the most often was parents and teachers saying, well, the kids are comfortable with it. It's just us that's not, that's worried about it. And uh, I think it was good to get that out in the open and, and get people talking about this subject. Yeah, that's fine. So, so that's what you saw that, like the educators who were watching this film could acknowledge like you know what when I'm screening this to my students in my class um, at my elementary school at my high school teachers really are acknowledging that their students are kind of walking away um, with this message and not struggling with it too much right? Oh yeah I think yeah. for sure in most cases I mean we all know that younger people aren't so uh, kind of fraught with all of the kind of um, fears about, you know, the issues, particularly in the U.S., the, the things that come up around gender and sexuality. Um, and for us, at least, I think with this story, it was really important that the story be presented through the voice of a young person. So in the film, it's actually told from Ho'onani's perspective, an 11-year-old sixth grader, and it's just her experience. And it's not, you know, adults kind of interpreting that or delivering that message. 
it's really a youth-oriented, youth-focused uh, story that allows adults to see, oh, okay, kids are already thinking about these things, and it's not that big of a deal. There's a great moment in the film where uh, two of Ponani's classmates are talking about her, and one says, yeah, she's half girl and half boy. The other one says, yes, yeah, no big deal. I mean, everyone just accepts it. There's no big deal. That's the attitude that we've heard from every, every, every kid that we've ever seen watching the film. It, it really is the parents and teachers that are worried. And another interesting screening experience was the film went to Germany to play in the Berlin Alley, which is a big film festival. But it was invited to be part of the children's section, and it actually played in the kindergarten plus section. So there are all of these like kindergarten kids filing into this big theater in Berlin to watch the film, and they were fine. Oh, that's the magic Woolen girl, you know. Um, and at least in Germany, the teachers were fine, too. They're a little bit more progressive in that regard. So, um, yeah, it's something that's just natural for kids. I mean, they, they understand that some girls are really good at doing boy stuff. No big deal. I love that you kind of spoke to the fact that as a response to the film, it's kind of highlighted the generational aspects of the gender conversation. And I'm curious as to like how you see the film helping to facilitate intergenerational conversations about gender. Um, you know, whether it's between a teacher and a student or, you know, a young person and their parent and their grandparent, so to speak. I'm curious if you've, um, you know, seen many folks have intergenerational conversations about gender as a result of this film being made. Yeah, I think, you know, we see that all the time. Um, here in Hawaii is where we have the most experience with doing these kind of events. And the Hawaii State Public Library System actually sponsored a tour of the film. So we screened all across, you know, eight islands here. And we went to small communities and large cities here. And at each event, it was filled with mostly with um, families, parents and kids. And at those events, when you watch a film like this, when it's really just a story. It's not, you know, like lessons, it's not didactic, it's not academic, it's just the experience of a young kid and her teacher in a school. It really allows kids an opportunity to um, think about how they might share a story that's similar to their experience because the girl, uh, the little girl in this film was able to do it. And we see kids opening up in these kinds of community conversations, which when adults, usually when adults run um, you know, workshops and sessions, et cetera, kids are, you know, they're quiet and they're not so easily engaged. But in these cases, it's usually the kids that take the lead. And that's really important. And it's important for parents finally to be able to start just listening to what's really going on in their kids' lives. And, and actually what's interesting, and maybe this is specific to Hawaii, maybe it's more general, is that um, kids get it and grandparents get it too. And maybe that's partially because in Hawaii, grandparents are more, were here when Hawaii was more Hawaiian. Um, and they're used to the idea of mahu. That's just part of the culture. I really, in a way, think that there has been a generation, at least in Hawaii, that's become hardened against this because of the intrusion of Western evangelical Christianity into Hawaii, which didn't used to be a major force here. This has always been a, a Buddhist state. Uh, in a rather gentle and progressive state. And we had this huge influx, uh, really from the continental USA, of evangelical groups that have had an impact. And those are the people that are against this stuff. Even if it's just a little girl, as soon as they hear anything about it, you know, gender, non-binary, trans stuff, they get nervous. But, um, but Tutu and Granny and Auntie are fine with it, and the kids are fine with it. So I'm hoping that that generation will slowly disappear, and, and then things will get back to it. But I want to just add, too, like, everything is not always rosy either. And I think in Hawaii, like a lot of other uh, kind of communities that are based more kind of in a cultural context that's not, you know, U.S., Western kind of uh, mainstream, um, there's a real reverence for family and respect. And so at some of these events, um, we start to hear stories that kids have kind of kept inside about their experience, things they've gone through where a teacher is not allowing them to express themselves as, as they see themselves in school. And 
when those things come out, it's really painful and difficult for kind of everybody, right? Because, you know, kids don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to shame the family. Um, parents sometimes are reluctant to go to a school and deal with a teacher or principal that might not be allowing their kid to be who they are because they don't want to rock the boat. And so when we hear those kinds of stories, it reminds us that even though there's a cultural, you know, at least a Hawaiian cultural perspective on these things here, it's not always respected in kind of the, uh, the mainstream of, of Hawaii. And that makes it really difficult to figure out how to move that conversation forward in the respectful way that the community wants. Wow, thank you, Joe and Dean. Um, <clears throat> I want to echo just a couple of points which you which you just touched on, which is a, a place in the middle. The film really is a resource for all ages, all age groups. And I, I remember I was flying on Hawaiian Airlines and saw that this short film was available for free, and so you know that everyone um, on the airplane could watch it. And definitely, I, I I'm a little bit biased because I've had the chance to. Not I've had the chance, I've wanted to, and so I've seen it, I, I think, over about 20 times now or something. Okay. That I can watch it with my younger siblings who are 8, 10 years old, right? And that I can watch it with my partner, that I can watch it with, um, and I have, and I've watched it with my aunts as well. So it really does do this intergenerational bridge that Mayor just spoke to. And then kind of to the latter p comments of what you were just touching on, you know, gender spectrum, a big part of gender spectrum's work is developing what it means to be a strong, supportive ally. Um, what it means to be an ally for yourself, and then what does it mean to, to support other gender-expensive young people. Um, allies peer-to-peer, -peer, young people to young people, and allies adults who are support, supporting youth, right? And I do get that sense in hearing the both of you speak. like. Here are a couple of white cisgender guys, just to name it, put it on the table, right? And here you are living in Hawaii, telling a very cultural narrative. Um, and yet, I, I really do find you speaking about this topic in a very, very appropriate way. That isn't a, it's not cultural appropriation. In fact, it's, it's very uplifting. I, I guess, how, how do you balance it all, and, and where do you see your role in all of this? And if you could just speak a little bit to that as well. Sure. I think the most important lesson that um, at least I learned moving to Hawaii um, is again something reflected in the film when Ponani says they're, they're learning hula together with the boys. And she says, and one of the boys asks a question, like, how do you do this? And she's like, don't ask questions, just look. That's how I learn, just look. And that's sort of what we've learned to do in Hawaii, is just look, listen, and in our case, record because we're filmmakers and let those voices speak for themselves and let the lessons come out by themselves. Rather than my natural inclination as a scientist, cisgender white guy, <laughs> old white guy, is uh, I'm going to interpret this and I'm going to write about it and I'm going to analyze it, I'm going to put it under the microscope and I will, you know, I'll write a paper about it. It's not the best way to do it. So we just try to authentically let the voices that are already here, the knowledge that's already here, um, be spoken and be heard. And I, I think that's the best that we can do. That's that's how we see ourselves as being the as being the most effective ally. And I think just to add to that a little bit. I mean, our personal experience, I think, led us to this place. And so, for me at least, having grown up in a small, conservative, um, working class town in Western Pennsylvania. Um, as a, I went through that experience of being um, a scared gay kid, feeling like there wasn't a place for me, and I couldn't be out, and I couldn't be open, and my family wouldn't accept me, um, and it took a long time for me to find um, my own path. And so through our previous film called Out in the Silence, which is about that particular town in Western Pennsylvania, what it's like to be a gay kid growing up in a conservative context, we you know, we really explored um, how young people in particular are working for change in those kinds of environments. And we saw a lot of backlash, and we saw a lot of um, responses that were just very harsh uh, to what it means to live openly as an LGB or T person. And so when we came to Hawaii as who we are, you know, two white uh, gay men, um, 
it was an epiphany for us in a way too, and so we viewed it as a learning experience to see a different cultural approach to this, and then as an honor and a privilege um, by Kumuhina and Ho'onani and her family and others who shared their stories with us, and then an obligation to just help share that so other people might be able to learn as we're learning as we go. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, you know, on the topic of the roles we take on, I want to kind of loop back to one crucial role in the film, which I think you alluded to, was your, um, you know, initial story. It really was Kumuhina. And I would love to hear from you about how important you think it was for Hoanami and her peers to have a role model like Kumuhina who happened to identify as Mahu. And what do you think this impact had on Hoanani and her peers to have Kumuhina as a role model and teacher? Oh, I think it's really important because here's Hina, and um, she is Mahu. She doesn't talk about that openly with the kids, but they understand that. Um, and what's great is that she's also the lead cultural teacher at the school, and she's looked up to maybe a little bit even feared by the kids because she's pretty strong, and they love her. Um, kids clamoring over her and hugging her and so supportive. And so I think it's absolutely um, critical. I think also, you know, any teacher, any gender, could have supported Honani in a good way. But it probably took someone like Kumuhina, who has experience herself as being a mahu and as being forced into the a male role as a young person even though she felt female and being forced to stand with a kane even though she wanted to be with a wakine. It took her to say, hey, why don't we create a new space specifically for people who are in the middle and we'll call it a place in the middle <laughs> because Hawaii is a very gendered place. It's not like everybody's the same. No, males and females have different roles and dance different dances and do different things and it took her as a mahu to actually create a specific space for people who are in the middle and to acknowledge it. And I think that's important because everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be acknowledged. Everyone wants to be, be held up as special. And, and that's exactly what Tina did. And um, I, I think, too, think what Nick is really cool about what she's doing is, you know, there seems to be like a lot of pressure now to apply labels and um, identities and identifications to people. But, you know what she's doing and through this idea of just having a place in the middle, it's like giving space, respecting kids enough to know that they should have an opportunity just to explore who they are and all the facets that might be out there and and not feel like you have to label yourself at any particular moment in time. But just go on that journey and know that the adults around you will support you and respect you. So I have another question for the both of you, and this is maybe a little bit taking the storyline now and making it um, a bit more personal to the two of you. Um, any key lessons you've learned in creating this film or making this project, and anything you want to share with the audience about the story that perhaps wasn't captured on film? <laughs> huh. I think for me it's uh, the idea of just um, don't try to always run things, don't try to always control things, and just let things unfold because it's the natural stories of life that are the, the most interesting and the most revealing. And if you do try to control everything and make it work the way you want it to, you're likely to miss the real story that's uh, behind it all. Yeah, I think it's a good um, I think the story that is not told in the film, and because it was complicated and just developing, is that the school that Ho'onani goes to is a public charter school supported by public funds. And Hawaii in the Constitution recognizes the importance of Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian history and mandates that it be taught. But there's also a lot of pressure to conform to Western standards, especially now with um, all of the rules about testing and common core and all of that so there's a sort of a, a constant pressure going on and that actually hit Ho'onani's school and, and Kumuhina's school quite hard. Um, they were not funded sufficiently by the public system 
Uh, charter schools are expected to go out and get their own money, which isn't always easy. Um, and that led to a lot of difficulties. And unfortunately, the school was closed down by the Charter Commission the next year. So um, there is this struggle even now to maintain uh, an infrastructure for, for perpetuating Hawaiian culture. It's a constant struggle. Mayor, is there any other questions on your end that you'd like to ask? Or if not, we could totally jump into some Q&A from the audience. Up to you. Let's jump into some Q&A for the audience and give them a chance to ask some questions. Sounds good, sounds good. Um, so folks, again, if you tuned in a little bit later, um, if you go into the top right-hand corner of your screen, you can toggle back and forth between the Q&A chat box and the showcase box, which offers um, a bunch of links to different resources. But go ahead and submit your questions live if you'd like. Um, over the past couple of weeks, we have had audience members uh, who have screened the film and watched it to submit their questions in various ways. They did it on the lounge. Uh, they may have tweeted us or they may have um, shared on Facebook as well. And so for those of you who, who do want to tweet um, our conversation, you could find us at Gender Spectrum. And then um, you know, to keep in touch with Joe and Dean and Kumuhina as well, you can also use the handle at Kumuhina, that's K-U-M-U-H-I-N-A. Also find us on Facebook, and then for any social media posts, um, why don't you go ahead and use the hashtag a place in the middle. So we did kind of compile a, a short list of preliminary questions, and actually I, I'm, I see this time and time again. I've seen it when um, I showed it to some high school students, and, and it's obviously come up again. Can we get some clarification on Onani's pronouns? Um, throughout this whole broadcast, we've been using she. Um, we said that she identifies in the middle. So how have you guys explained Onani's kind of gender identity out to the world? Well, I guess first of all, we, we don't necessarily think that we have the right you know, to explain Ho'onani to anybody. She presented herself in the film as she is. Um, and she talks about herself as a girl, but she has, she herself has lots of male energy and she's choosing to make sure she has a right to express that. And that's who Ho'onani is, and that's why we use the pronoun she, because she did at that time. Um, you know, Ho'onani now, that was uh, already several years ago. She's a 10th grader at a high school, a big, you know, inner city high school here in Honolulu. And, you know, she's thriving. And she continues to kind of, I think, break people's kind of, like, expectations. And so, you know, recently she appeared as a male lead in, like, a school play that they did. And, you know, she's extremely popular um, with her peers. You know, she's talented musically and artistically and all these things. So... She continues just to be who she is, and for now, she's she. That's great, and um, we appreciate you kind of speaking to the fact that it's you know best for for folks to speak for themselves about who they are and their own pronouns. And um, you know, I think it's wonderful that in your facilitation of discussions of this film that you all share that message as well. I do see a question that came in from one of our live viewers. Bradley wants to thank you so much for making this film. They greatly enjoyed it and wants to know what advice you would have for other filmmakers that are trying to tell youth stories. Good question, Bradley. Thanks for asking that. And thanks for the, the, you know, the compliments on the film. We appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I would just say find somebody who's really cool and <laughs> let them lead you to the right place. And... Never turn off your camera. Just keep it running all the time. Sometimes the best moments aren't the scripted interviews or the scenes you've set up. It's when things happen. And so just keep them running and keep your microphone on the person and let them take you where, where they'll go. And don't feel like you have to explain things. Just let things be expressed and know that trust your audience that you know they'll find the messages that the young people are trying to convey. So I have another audience question. Um, 
clearly you guys have accomplished some great feats here. And um, I, I, we'd just love to know what's coming up next. What are some upcoming projects you're working on? What's, what's oh, in the purview here? Uh, we've got some cool stuff to share. We've got some great <laughs> things. Um, we're doing some short pieces uh, about uh, schools here in Hawaii and stories that we've learned about as we've gone around with the film. But our newest big project takes place in the Kingdom of Tonga. And the Kingdom of Tonga is a group of very small islands. Um, it's in the Pacific, not in Africa. <laughs> People don't know that. It is uh, one of the most conservative places in the world. It's still run by an actual monarchy who owns all the land. It's one of the most Christian and religious places in the world. Um, there's six churches in every village. It's 100% Christian. On, on Sunday, the entire island shut down. And it is also home to the Miss Galaxy pageant, which is the most spectacular transgender, mahu, cross-dressing, uh, hilarious, extravagant, transgender beauty pageant in the entire world. And uh, all of that is because of a wonderful character named Joey Matteelli, who is a member of the royal family and who is also like a lady or fuck a lady herself who's transgender. And um, so we're kind of following that story because it's an interesting example of how you can have uh, ge differences in gender identity, men, you know, melding somehow with a very religious society. And, and how that's all navigated is quite fascinating. And just to comment on the terms you just used, um, Dean, yeah. that you know we are using the term mahu as it uh, pertains and relates to Hawaiian culture and identity, and then maybe yeah. um, more people familiar with two spirit identity um, yeah. relating to Native American yeah. continental. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in Tonga, they're using the word Leiti. Mm -hmm. So Leiti is obviously kind of derives from lady, but um, there's even you know different kind of terminology that is sometimes used pejoratively. And so the Joey Mataele, this amazing leader in Tonga, is really working with her peers to advocate on behalf of you know the basic you know uh, human rights of, of transgender folks in Tonga and beyond. And to get people to adapt the respectful use of the word Leiti. Uh, just to mention also, there's a great resource on a place in the middle.org, you may have it too, that's a, a map of gender diversity around the world uh, with references to the. A lot of societies have third genders and fourth genders and fifth genders and more that are recognized um, all around the Pacific, but also all the way up to Siberia and in Europe and in Asia and Asia Minor um, and uh, that those are all available on this this map that's at the, at the website. Yeah, I'm familiar with the website and we'll definitely link back to it um, on the lounge in the reframing, reframing Gender Through Film group as well for people out there. Great. Great. And I think one more question popped up from our audience, and I love this question because I think it really speaks to the practical applications of this film. How would you recommend educators you use this film in their classrooms? Hmm. Well, so there's a lot of answers to that question. Um, on a, a really basic level, at a place in the middle.org, we have made the, the video itself available for free to anybody who might want to watch it and, and use it in their work. And we have made also for free a downloadable um, discussion or conversation guide that helps to illuminate some of the themes in the film and prompt either teachers or educators or other community allies and advocates who want to use it with the kind of questions that people can explore. But really, I think you know, we feel it's up to people to kind of view it from their own kind of context and perspective and use it in that way. Like, just take it as a tool, not as um, something that has all the answers to it. And, and I would say we've been excited because it's been used now in many schools in quite different contexts. So it's great in social studies, like ninth grade social studies, to talk around uh, diverse cultures around the world. It's great in history to talk about colonialism and U.S. imperialism. Um, it works really well in sort of health classes, which is usually where gender and sexuality comes up, to show that 
there's different ways of looking at gender than the way that we usually do um, in the continental USA. And it's also been used, for example, for peer education courses where classes, young people look at it and then take the project to other classrooms and use something called the Pledge of Aloha as a sort of activity to get people mobilized. Um, of course, it's also great for GSAs that are specifically interested in educating their classmates and their the families about, about gender issues. Um, so yeah, there are quite a few different ways that it can be used because it's a, a story that has many different avenues in and out. Great. Thanks so much for sharing. And we had another question come in from Maria. Maria wants to know how the community reacted to you wanting to film the story. Um, when we started, we were a little bit nervous because there haven't there hasn't been a lot of media coverage of the sort of mafu issue in Hawaiian communities. And what we found in the end was people were so happy to have the story come out. We had so many Hawaiian families say, you know, this is something we've always had, and we're just really glad that the story is, is coming out now. So um, we've had a tremendous response from the Hawaiian community. I think they were genuinely quite quite delighted that, that the story came out. Yeah, and, and this goes back, I think, to the earlier question that Adam raised about what does it mean when, you know, kind of, um, people with our background, um, you know, follow um, people from a different culture and then help to share their story. And that was obviously sensitive. It's obviously something we thought about a lot, like how best to do that. And the decision that we made was first um, to form as strong a relationship as possible with Hina or Kumu Hina, teacher Hina, in the larger PBS film we were making. and by gaining her trust and her respect um, and because of the respect she has in her school and in the community, our affiliation with her immediately granted us you know, some kind of credibility to all of the other people that we would encounter along the way. And, and that way we've just tried to be as transparent and open as possible about who we are and what we were doing and um, allow the stories to speak for themselves. We made a really clear decision never to feel like we had the right to interpret um, or analyze uh, Kumuhina or you know, Ho'onani or anybody else in the story. They speak for themselves. And we are just kind of the vehicle. I think that wraps up all of our audience questions. Mayor, did you have any personal ones you just wanted to get out there or I'm trying to think I mean I've watched the film a couple times now and you know I'm, I'm curious actually you know in Western culture I think we often find that folks that sometimes uh, fall in the middle in terms of how they identify their gender how they express themselves are often assumed to be gay or bisexual and it's not about their gender and I wonder if you see that as well in Hawaiian culture or if you know young people are introduced to this mahu term and so they can more clearly identify issues related to gender as different than sexual orientation. Did Ho Nani's peers see her as potentially gay? <laughs> it's an interesting and complicated situation, just as it is uh, every place, because there is an intertwining. But I do think that having a term like mahu, as compared to the other Hawaiian term ikane, which means same-sex lovers or uh, intimates, um, does allow people here to have a more clear uh, distinction between gender and sexuality. Having said that, it's also true that in the last you know, decades, the word mahu uh, became misused, similar to the word queer, faggot, in a bad sort of way, just to mean gay. And I think that um, people like Kina, who want to re-establish the Hawaiian meaning, see that as a, a misinterpretation of the culture. But yeah, they do get jumbled together, but I think there's the potential for more of a separation here because historically that's been that's been true. 
and just you know having heard you know we travel with Hina a lot and and have these kinds of conversations with Hina and others in the room that have a Hawaiian perspective and I think the way Hina often talks about these kinds of things is by saying as opposed to the way kind of mainstream US discourses on these kinds of things everybody's feeling like they have to kind of make a declaration about who they are that's not necessarily the Hawaiian way not just on this kind of subject but in a lot of ways it's more just to allow people to get to know you who for you for who you are in a more kind of holistic sense than making any particular pronouncements about one aspect of yourself or another. It's about do you have respect for your family? Do you have respect for your culture and your community? Do you act in a positive you know, uh, way that um, puts forward another tagline in the film is the film is about the true meaning of aloha. So are you showing unconditional respect acceptance and love for everybody around you. And if you are, then, you know, that's really what the message of this film is about. That's good. Yeah, Drew and Dean, I, I really have seen how the kind of the, the reclaiming and, as you put, Dean, the reestablishment of the word mahu by young people in Hawaii, in Hawaii schools, um, by both Native Hawaiian and non-Native, but locally born kids, um, right. that that there is a movement happening happening here and that's what that's just another thing you know it's I think it's a really long list as we can see of what this film is capable of um, but let's tack that on there that is it is also empowering young people to reclaim this identity um, and more specifically for Native Hawaiians to reclaim it for themselves if they so identify yeah um, Joe and Dean from the bottom of our hearts, we were so, we're so thankful, so appreciative to have you joining us today uh, for this conversation. I had a lot of fun. Um, again, learning new things all the time from the both of you. Mares, anything else you want to add? Just want to thank you both for sharing this film and your time today, and we just really look forward to continuing the conversation. I know you know this film is showing up in a lot of gender spectrums work and we are look forward to just opportunities to continue to um, you know have the conversation through film mahalo yeah mahalo thank you so much we're you know, again just really honored to be a part of the work you're doing so onward we all go together yeah yes yeah. all right take care guys I hope to speak with you and talk to you uh, really soon bye bye aloha, aloha.